Welcome to the Wickedly Smart Women podcast, featuring stellar conversations with emerging and established Wickedly Smart Women. Thanks for joining us today as we celebrate women who are committed, care deeply, and have the courage to take action and create conscious change all around the world. Now here's your Wickedly Smart host, Angel B. Hartwell. Welcome to another episode of the Wickedly Smart Women podcast, where we celebrate wickedly smart women and provide our listeners with a wealth of wisdom, along with immediately actionable steps to be smarter, spunkier, and more successful in their impact and their leadership. This is your host, Angel B. Hartwell, and today we welcome our special guest, Maria C. Palmer. Maria hosts 30,000 visitors a month on her social media pages, featuring recipes and her life working in a family restaurant business. Her book, On the Rocks, about the rise of her A-list restaurateur father to his sharp fall ending with a stint in federal prison, was named a 2021 Page Turner Award finalist. Her family restaurant, The Prima Donna, was named one of the top 10 Italian restaurants in America. Maria is a regular co-moderator on Clubhouse, which is where we met, under the Food is Religion Club, the largest and fastest growing food affinity group on the app, hailing 6,000 members. I am so excited to have you here with me today, Maria. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here, Angel. Well, I am a little bit of a foodie myself. I love food. Who doesn't love food? (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) I mean, who doesn't love food? So I want to talk, Maria, about your, like, when did you get turned on? Because sometimes when we grow up in a family that has a family business in a particular industry, we can become enamored of that and carry the torch forward through the next generation. And other times we can be like, yeah, I'm not having anything to do with that. So tell us a little bit about your, maybe your childhood and your story with food. Oh my goodness. It's an ever changing and ever growing process, right? Food is very, very central. So I grew up in an Italian American home both of my father's parents came from Italy at very young ages. So food was always central to every gathering, everything that we did. I remember Sundays, I recently wrote an essay about Sundays at my grandparents' house and how that was just the central place for us all to gather. And it was in a way her my grandmother's way to show us love. So she would make all of this wonderful food all day just for us to sit down and enjoy it. And it was not only just a way for nourishment, but it was a way to kind of connect us all and bond us. And I didn't realize how influential those meals really were on my my upbringing. And I think that because food was so central to our family, my grandfather actually went into the bar business. And although it was mostly just drinks, my grandmother, because she was such an amazing cook, she would make appetizers for a happy hour. And it really was a draw for that bar. And and my dad kind of growing up in that, he always wanted to start a restaurant. It was always his pipe dream. And as you know, sometimes Angel, our dreams steer off a little bit and Mm -hmm. we go down different paths. So he was actually a postal worker at first and he had a very stable job. He was a mail carrier. He worked, I think, from seven in the morning until two in the afternoon. And then he was done every day, but it just wasn't enough for him. He kind of yearned to get into the food business. So whenever he entered that business, he did so with this dream of opening a world-class restaurant. But what he didn't have is he didn't have the knowledge of it and he did not have the money to do so either. Mm -hmm. So he bought this failing restaurant and really built it from the ground up. And growing up in that restaurant business, it was 
very magical. It was during the 80s and 90s, a very different time than today, as my kids call it, the dinosaur years, right? <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they really do. They said, wait, you didn't have a computer, no telephone, no nothing. But what we did have was I had this whole, you know, kids now they have these plastic play sets. They play kitchen, mm -hmm. they grill for you. They do all these things. I had the real thing. So at four years of age, my dad buys this restaurant and we're down there a lot because he's working during the day. And it, it, during the day, my mom has to help out at the restaurant and at night he's at the restaurant. So I'm there all the time. And I'm having this really magical experience because all of a sudden now I'm a server serving my teddy bears, pasta. I'm a bartender. You know, my Barbies are getting a little cocktail <laughs> after they come back from Malibu or whatever Barbies do, right? I'm becoming a cook. I'm it, looking in the kitchen and seeing what ingredients I could sort of mix together. So growing up in the restaurant, really had its perks. The flip side of that, and it, that was the first part of your question, is there was also a lot of jealousy there, right? Because my dad went from this seven to two, very easy job where he spent a lot of time with us and doing things with us. And then all of a sudden now he's working that job on top of trying to open this restaurant. We never saw him. Mm. And the restaurant kind of became this third child. I call it the little brother that I never had, right? And so it was annoying at times because he was there all the time. Mm. And we didn't want to be there all the time. You know, we we had other things to do. So we just didn't see him quite as much. So there was definitely a yin-yang, a time where I think I didn't love the restaurant, but it all kind of started coming back again, I would say, whenever I was in high school and college, whenever I started working at the restaurant with my father. And I started not only just learning about how to serve people and learning about food and learning the process, but learning about dealing with the public and how to interact with people that you may not be familiar with or may not be easy. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I always joke and I say, you know, I'm master's educated. I went to Pepperdine for my master's in psychology. I went to Syracuse undergrad for, well, at first broadcast journalism, then public relations. And I always say, you know where I learned the most, where I was educated the most? Mm -hmm. It was at 801 Broadway Avenue at the Prima Donna restaurant in McKees Rocks, PA. We learned so much about life there. Yeah. And well. that is something that you just can't, you know. Yeah, of course. Can't take away. Yeah, you got PR and psychology for sure in a restaurant. No doubt about that. <laughs> I worked in a restaurant myself. My first real job was in a restaurant that was just down the street from my house and the interesting thing I went in when I was like 16 to the restaurant mm -hmm. and my first day I knew nothing and they told me to make the coffee and I I knew nothing. I didn't know anything about <laughs> anything and there was no training. This was back before the dinosaur days, prehistoric, pre-dinosaur days. So Jeez, if you think the 80s were you, and were 90s <laughs> yeah. were dinosaur days, this was pre-dinosaur days. And the, the owner slash chef, he had his bottle of vodka open first thing in the morning. So like by noon after the lunch rush, he was up at, at the house, passed out. And I was left all by myself to like make sure that the 12 <laughs> knives, we had 12 knives <laughs> to make sure that all the knives got like pulled off the table and washed quickly to give back to the next customer <laughs> while simultaneously cooking and making coffee and all the other fun things. So I have a little bit of restaurant under my thumb. I definitely do not have a top 10 Italian restaurant in America experience. So <laughs> I want to ask you, Maria, now, you know, tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write this book. Like, obviously, you know, there was the dad is busy all the time at work. How does dad go from postmaster all day 
working at the restaurant all night to suddenly going into federal prison. (laughs) And what happened there? (laughs) There was a long time span between the two. So he only really worked two jobs. I think for the first year he was in operation just to make sure that this was going to stick because he was able to hold his job at the post office just in case it wasn't going to work. But He just had this outward determination that no matter what, he was going to make this happen because this was really his dream. And so he really did the impossible and he built it from the ground up and he built it without the help of Zoom or Clubhouse or Yelp or even MapQuest, you know, the the prima donna became a destination, but it definitely was a destination that people, if they needed directions, they were getting a trip to it. You know, they wasn't easily accessible. There were no viral videos or anything like that. So he really did this by making one relationship at a time with people and also functioning in a town that was, and if you're not familiar with Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh had a large boom right around the steel mill times and many immigrants moved in. And so Pittsburgh's very similar to Boston, where you have these enclaves of different nationalities that kind of live and support one another. So McKees Rocks, Pennsylvania was a heavily immigrant area, specifically Southern Italian Calabrese people. And that's where they all lived. And that happens to be what my dad's father was too, even though my dad was not originally from McKees Rocks, Pennsylvania, but just trying to figure out how to break in to that particular neighborhood was not easy. And this is not the type of neighborhood that if you're going to Pittsburgh, it's not on like the top 10 places that you want (laughs) to see. It's probably like the top 10 places that you might try to avoid other than McKees Rocks was largely unknown until this past winter when the Buffalo Bills NFL player Jamar Hamlin collapsed on the field. He is actually originally from McKees Rocks, Pennsylvania, and the alley of the charity that he's been raising money for shares an alleyway with what once was my father's restaurant. But building that restaurant was really a struggle, and he was able to get that one great review that led to bigger and greater things. And I have to laugh at your little story about only having... 12 knives. So the day after his big review and the uh, critic that reviewed him told him, listen, you're not going to be able to handle this business. You're a kid with a neighborhood place. And my dad said to him, listen, like I'm a diamond in the rough. If you give me what I deserve, I'll make you look good. And so that next day, the critic was exactly right. We could not handle the business. We were maybe doing... I don't know, a dozen dinners a night before all of a sudden it's 50 dinners in an hour. And at one point we ran out of plates. (laughs) So (laughs) nothing came out for like an hour. And my dad comes, comes into the kitchen and says, what is going on here? And they said, well, we're just waiting for people to be done. Why are you waiting for other people to be done? Like you need to be cooking and getting these meals out. We have no plates. Yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my grandmother had to drive down plates because, you know, what does every Italian guy do whenever he's in trouble, right? Calls he calls his, his mother. <laughs> yeah, you call well, mom. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about him getting in trouble after the break. <laughs> we're going to take a quick break right now because he called his mom for the plates. I'm curious about whether he called his mom for the stint in federal prison. But right now we need to take a (laughs) short break. So when we come back, we'll get more about that story. Wickedly Smart Women, we could use your help. If you are enjoying the show, please consider joining our community, making a donation at www.wickedlysmartwomen.com and sharing with your lovely lady friends that might benefit from our content. Please help a gal out and let your sisters, mothers, daughters, friends, and colleagues know about the show so that we can serve them too. I want to say a big thank you to all of our listeners who are downloading, rating, and reviewing. We're welcoming thousands of downloads from all over the world. We're up to 108 countries now. So we're going to shout out this week to our listeners. Of course, we have to shout out to our listeners in Italy. 
And we will also Ooh. shout out to our listeners. Why don't we make Pennsylvania? We'll put Pennsylvania on the list yeah. there. And our listeners in Bolivia. And we will be right back with Maria Palmer. The Wickedly Smart Women podcast is brought to you by the Wealthy Life Mentor. Women, are you on the edge knowing that life is calling you to make a change? Are you ready to be part of the evolution of what it means to be a wickedly smart woman creating your wealthy life by design, a life that is an extraordinary work of art? Angel B. Hartwell, the Wealthy Life Mentor, is hired by Women in Transition, Women just like you who want to break through to their brilliance, become clear on the value of their wisdom, and embody a beauty-filled, balanced life of shameless self-expression. Discover your wealthy life readiness by taking the quiz at quiz.wealthylifementor.com. And we are back with Maria Palmer. Before we went to the break, we were talking about her dad calling his mom to get extra plates. But before we go deeper into that story, we want to make sure that you know how to find Maria. She is at mariacpalmer.com. And we will have that for you in the show notes. All of her connection data is there on that website. And I'm guessing that they can also get the book on the rocks there as well. So let's talk about on the rocks because my, you know, I'm sure. guessing that this whole, this whole story that you're telling is in the book. So yes. I want to pivot quickly to focusing on you, Maria, because we've talked a lot about your dad, but you were the one who ended up deciding to write his life story and to write this book. So what inspired you to do that? Well, you know, at the time it was, this has been a 17 year journey for me. And whenever my father lost the restaurant because he was under federal investigation and eventually pled guilty to tax evasion charges and spent some time in federal prison. And we sort of lost everything that he built as quickly as he built it. So losing that was a really challenging loss for him. It was very similar. As I had joked earlier in the show, it was the third son that he never had. It was something that he just loved and became such a part of him because it was his outlet to the world to not only feed the world, but to show people love, to be part of people's special moments, to be part of people's hard moments. All that happens whenever you own a restaurant. And when it was stripped away, it was really, you know, quite a challenge for him. And after he had gotten out of prison, he spent five months there and really didn't know what he wanted to do, but you could just tell that there was no more pep in his step. Mm -hmm. And he's the type of person that really lives life fully and largely. And when he's in the room, you know, he's in the room, right? Cause you hear his laugh and you just feel his presence and that, that wasn't there anymore. And so we started this project as a family history and I started it specifically because I wanted him to remember better times. And for him, the restaurant was the best time of his life. So I'm a writer by trade. I work as a nonprofit grant writer. That's my regular nine to five. And so I would say, tell me a story. Tell me about the time that you got that big review. Tell me about a time that something really crazy happened. And I had those old fashioned tape recorders, you know, that you would mm -hmm. use to record lectures. Dinosaur and days. I would just, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> dinosaur days, right? I would just let him run with it and I would just let him talk. But, you know, the writer in me kept on hearing these stories and saying, yes, it's my dad. And everybody thinks their family's interesting, right? But there was this commercial element to it. He would say things like, did I ever tell you about whenever Johnny from the rocks came into the restaurant and he brought this stripper and he, they got into a fight after hours and he left the stripper and I had to take her back home. And I'm like, no, do tell. <laughs> <laughs> 
And it was story after story Mm -hmm. after story like that. Or, you know, did I tell you about the time that Danny Aiello came in and we talked about how both of us had later in life career changes and we shared a veal parmesan? No, do tell. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And these all became the inner workings of what led to the book. Now, whenever I figured out I wanted it to be a book, there's this Peter principle. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, where you can promote somebody beyond their capacity. And so I had done as much as I could do and I couldn't do anymore. And so I know, I knew at that point that I needed some help to get it all together. And I had this wonderful teacher, my AP English teacher, Ruthie Dines, now Ruthie Robbins. And she grew up in McKee's Rocks and she's the exact same age as my father. And she was a customer at the restaurant and also my favorite teacher. And I was friends with her oldest son and she had just recently gotten divorced. She moved to Buffalo, New York, and she was spending her free time editing books for a writer's group in Buffalo. And so she had heard that I was writing the story and she said, you know, can I take the story to the writer's group? I'd like to see, you know, what they think. And so she did and, you know, confirmed what we already knew. It needed a lot of work, but it had a lot of potential. Mm -hmm. And so from that moment on, we started working together and we were co-authors on this project and we worked throughout the pandemic to finish it and to polish it. And we decided to write it in his voice and to tell, take back our pen and to tell the story that just abruptly ended so tragically. And now it has a happy ending and there's a second wind. So beautiful. Well, and it's a 2021 page Turner award finalist. So you know, those who are listening are our listeners around the world. If you want to get a hold of this book and get inspired by this wonderful story, I would highly recommend it. So we have only a few minutes left, Maria. So what I'd love to have you do now is just talk a little bit about like what what do you most want our listeners to know either about this story about you as a writer, about food, about, you know, this mythic heroic journey of taking a dream and putting it into reality. Pick any one of those and let our listeners know what's like really on your heart to share here at the very end. Sure. I think I'm going to kind of close this because, you know, we, life is hard sometimes, right? And I, I think if anything is evident and what I want people to take away from this is that we can sometimes be on our highest of highs. Whenever everything happened with my father before his downward spiral, he couldn't have been more on top of the world. He had just gotten a Girona Award, which is equivalent to a James Beard Award. He was just named one of America's top 10 Italian restaurants, top 10 restaurateurs in America. We had celebrities, broadcasters, sports stars, you name it, coming into the place. And then it all changed with one knock on the door. And that was whenever the federal government came looking and telling us that he was under investigation for somebody mentioning him as his name in a federal grand jury. And so what I want to tell listeners is that doesn't have to be the end of your story. What happened after then in my second book that I'm working on right now is I had a huge downward spiral, panic attacks, anxiety, depression. I had no purpose and I tried so hard to run away from those problems. I left, I went to California (laughs) to get away from those problems, but they hopped in my suitcase. But just know that one of your worst days could turn out to be in essence, something that you can get through and that the most successful people in life, and I strongly believe this, I tell this all the time to the nonprofit clients that I work with right now, are not the smartest people. They're the most resilient people. So we all make mistakes. We all fall. But if you can stand up and you can hang on, dust yourself off, 
And even if you can just do one simple task, like put one foot in front of the other or schedule sleep and eating, and that's it, that's okay. Cause the next day you're going to grow more and you're going to get better and you're going to heal and you're going to be a much fuller person because of these things, you know, the most beautiful thing on a tiger is the stripes, right? And we we earn those from the, the hard challenges that we go through. So that's what I want listeners to take away from this is that your story doesn't have to end whenever something horrible happens. You can turn it into something very positive. And now where we're all sitting and where my dad's sitting, you know, he lost everything. And now looking back on it, he's going through one of the happiest moments in his life. And he said, you know, Maria, I haven't been this happy since my restaurant won all of these awards because I'm getting the full circle now. And people are getting a chance to know my story and to appreciate what I've gone through. And I can teach them the lessons on the other side. And I think that that is a really nice way to kind of end our conversation. Mm, beautiful. Well, I just want to tie a little bow on that and say, you know, if we're going to talk about going full circle, it feels to me, and this is just like a intuitive feeling, it feels to me like your grandmother who was giving people food all day long, was watching <laughs> over, you know, the whole family throughout this entire journey. And it was the grounding in that deep family connection and the nourishment from that, that has allowed both your dad and yourself to have the kind of resilience that you're talking about. So I don't know what your grandmother's Amen. name was, but why don't we give her a shout out too? Yes. Yeah, so my grandmother's name was Helena, and that's actually the name of my oldest daughter too. And whenever you said that, Angel, it just warms my heart so much because we always had such a special, wonderful connection. And she left this world very suddenly. So to hear that, you know, she's kind of a part of this full circle that just makes my heart smile <laughs> tenfold. So thank you. You are so welcome. All right, beautiful people, listeners, we do love feedback. We are at the end of this episode and we'd love to have you let us know what you thought of it. So please go right now to www.wikileysmartwomen.com to join our community, share your takeaways, ask questions or submit guest suggestions. Thank you so much for tuning in. Keep your ears open and remember, you are a wonderful woman. Thanks for tuning in, downloading, and listening. Be sure to rate and review Wickedly Smart Women on Apple Podcasts and share with other women who can benefit from today's episode. Wickedly Smart Women is the premier podcast series for informing, activating, and inspiring the leader who carries profound wisdom and knows that now is the time to welcome wealth. We welcome your feedback and guest suggestions and invite you to subscribe to our mailing list to be notified of each new episode at wickedlysmartwomen.com.